something in particular? Yeah, finance. Finance? That's where you want to go. You got the best. You got to pull it down more, Bob. Yep. Okay, does anybody have the time? 5.32. Okay. So I'll call the meeting of the Finance Committee to order. All members are present. Approval of the previous meeting, October 15th. I'll make a motion for one second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. Monthly finance and bills review. Does anybody have any questions? No. no. I do not. I, I just had one for our city attorney, but I talked court. to Tiffany earlier, so that's all set. And I can arrange to have the end of year for the next committee meeting to give an update on the status of the Thank you. Okay, unfinished business. Any tips? Okay, new referrals for consideration, presentation, and discussion for three plus one finance advisors. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have Alex DeRosa here. Uh, Alex uh, uh, met with Fred and I uh, back uh, a couple different times, and uh, I believe he's going to talk to us about uh, ways we may be able to increase uh, the interest on, uh, on our monies. Thank you. All right, hello. Again, my name is Alex DeRosa. I'm from 3 Plus 1. So we are a little bit different than most financial companies that any public entity would interact with mm -hmm. for a couple different reasons, and I think it's most important to start off with those reasons. Number one, we're not a bank. We don't take deposits. If I was a banker, my goal would be to come here tonight and to convince you all to put some money with 3 Plus 1, let us hold on to it and pay you a little bit more interest, but then I would make money on, on the money that I hold for you. That's not what we do. We don't want the city's money at any point in time. Uh, number two, we're not a financial advisor. We don't purchase investments on behalf of public entities, and we don't make investment decisions for you all. If I was a money manager, my goal would be, again, to get deposits from you and then purchase investments and keep some of that spread. So that's not at all what our firm does at 3 Plus 1. What we are is a data company. It gives specifically public entities cash flow and liquidity data that helps them maximize their financial resources. And we do this specifically with public entities. We're based in Rochester, New York, and we have a sponsorship with the New York State Association of Counties and the National Association of Counties because of the work that we've done specifically in New York to help public entities increase their interest earnings and maximize their financial resources for the taxpayers. We do operate in other states, but New York is our biggest state, and that's the one where we have a great partnership with the Association of Counties. Um, but really, what we're talking about providing Fred and his finance team with is data and information and marketplace expertise that can help the city maximize the value of your cash at all times. When we're talking about the value of cash, one of the most important factors is time. If you're going for a loan, uh, the bank's going to ask you how long do you want to pay it off over? One year, five years, 30 years? That drives the rate that you're able to get on that loan. The same thing can be said about the cash that the city is holding at different times throughout the year. And what we do at 3 Plus 1 is provide analyses to show the city and other public entities how much cash you have and how long it's available for. So you know your flexibility in the marketplace, and then we help you implement a plan in order to actually increase your, or your earnings and realize um, some increased benefits there. The other side of what we do is on the treasury services side. So we look at all of your functions in your finance office to see where funds are moving to and from, what type of account structure you have, to make sure that it's efficient and works best for your office. Because if we were a company that came and delivered a report of recommendations and then Fred came back to me and said, well, we can't do this because of this, this, and this, we wouldn't get anywhere. I, we want to learn how your office operates so that we can deliver tools to you that can help you earn and save more consistently. We are a company that is founded on analytics, and we believe that the use of analytics should be more popular within public entities. 
so that taxpayers are able to hold you all accountable to know that you are doing everything you possibly can. And that's why the New York State Association of Counties decided to sponsor our firm and support us throughout New York State. And we have helped numerous entities. Uh, I think we work at about 20 counties throughout the state right now. And we also work with towns, school districts, any other public entities. Um, to put a comparable to you all, we just started working with the city of Batavia about five months ago. And they have already realized um, five figures in increased interest earnings in that period of time. And what we do in our initial report that we deliver to public entities is put a number on how much we can help you earn in the next 12 months. And for the city of Batavia, their increased interest earnings was well over $150,000 in one year. And it's a process that we do through that initial report in which we provide data. But after that point, we continually provide updated data and implementation support because we work with the network of banks across New York State and we know what's available in the marketplace. Fred can speak to this, I'm sure, but you all here at the city, you know your cash flow better than my company ever will. What we know is your liquidity, how, which is how your bank looks at the cash. And that's what's most important when we're talking about increasing interest earnings and earning a little bit more on those dollars. Because if the bank thinks you need all your dollars tomorrow, they're gonna pay you a much lower rate than if you can go to the bank and have a conversation and say, well, actually, we have this bucket here that we don't need for the next three months. What can you do with this? And that's why it's important for me to note that our goal is to always work within your current financial providers, the current banks that you work with. We're not a company that comes to the table and says, well, we heard about this bank in upstate New York that's willing to pay 3% on something. We don't try to encourage any of these to change institutions because we're completely independent. The only thing that we do is provide data and provide you with marketplace options. The city is consistently in control of your own cash, making your own decisions. My goal is to provide data so you can make a confident decision quicker than ever before that you are maximizing the value of your dollars. And I know in my conversations with Mariano and Fred, Fred mentioned that this is something that he feels finance office just does not have the time to do that type of analysis and reporting and that's why we do what we do because this is the case across all public entities we were founded by two government bankers who are also public officials uh, our ceo joe rulison is the treasurer of monroe county water authority and our co-founder peter forsgren is the president of fairport school board in their previous lives they were government bankers for jp morgan chase and fleet bank so they spent their careers in public finance officers, offices and then as public finance officials, and they identified this need within public entities. And that's why they created our firm, because they knew they would be able to help bring this data and information that banks have always had internally out to public entities so that you all can earn a little bit more and benefit from that. But I think the most important thing for me to really drive home that I continually want to say is that we are completely independent and leave the power of decision making in your hands. If I was a banker, my would, I would be incentivized to sit here and tell you, oh, you should work with three plus one because we're going to help you with this and this because I would get paid based on you putting your money with three plus one. That's not how we operate. We don't make any more money if you put your funds with bank one versus bank two. We, our initial analysis charge is $15,000. It's a one-time fee, and we don't even charge that. We don't send a bill until we're able to provide a report that shows at least a three-to-one benefit in the next 12 months, which would be a $45,000 benefit in the next 12 months. If we can't meet that benefit, can't prove it to you through that report, then we never charge a fee, and you're free to use that report how you please and don't have to work with three plus one. Once we deliver that report, and if we do prove our benefit for our ongoing services, we charge $300 per quarter per million dollars that we identify as funds we can help you earn more on, as funds that can have increased interest earnings or increased opportunity on. And that's what our fee is for ongoing implementation and updated data. Our average return on investment for our clients is about seven and a half to one. So for every dollar you spend at three plus one, your return would be seven, seven and a half dollars. Um, but 
the nature of our business is the fact that I can't tell you how much I'll be able to help you until I get to see your data, which is why we provide that benefit. We say, give us the chance to prove to you that we actually are going to be able to help you. And if we can't, it will be clear in the data and we'll show that to you. And we have had entities before that we were not able to help and some of them are references for us now so that they know that we're honest to our word on that. But we have plenty more references throughout New York State that have realized the tremendous amount of benefit that can be to the table um, just by increased use of data and analytics, knowing that every dollar is earning how much it possibly, as much as it possibly can, based on the marketplace and how long it's available for. Anyone have any preliminary questions? Do you have an example? Do you have an example report? I don't have one on me, but I can definitely share one with you all. Yeah. Yeah, that would. I think that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I understand what your what the concept is, I guess I would like to see it in practice. Mm -hmm. um, so the, this is just really the the only functional tool that we have is a report that you provide us. It's not an online tool that we can log into to get updated market rates. This is something that you guys monitor. Is that correct? Correct. It is essentially that report that's updated quarterly okay. and then continuing support for myself. I am implementing with my clients daily. If you need something, you give me a call at any point in time, but I'm also reaching out to my clients with opportunities and updated rates regularly. So give me an example of such. So earlier this morning, I have a client who had a CD maturing at JP Morgan Chase. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to them to let them know this is gonna be maturing today. But at the same time, they have another account with JP Morgan to purchase securities, treasuries. And we had a conversation about how long these funds that were maturing are available for based on their data and what the differential and rates would be between using treasuries at JP Morgan and CDs at JP Morgan. And from that conversation, I provided them with the information necessary for them to make their own decision on how they wanted to proceed when the bank contacted them to let them know that there was a decision point coming because these funds were maturing and either were going into a bank account or out into another investment. So you track the maturity, you track the maturities for the municipality? Yes. That is information that we have um, based on you all sharing your view only access to the bank account portals. Fred, what is the length of time when we have something maturing? So help me understand where the shortfall is for, for you. Are there times where something matures and, and we don't reinvest it in a timely fashion? The only, we have all of our money with Five Star Bank in yep. 15 or 20 accounts. And they're just simple interest bearing accounts. Ah. We don't borrow money from the bank. The only borrowing we do is when we take out debt and repay it. So this, this whole concept is exciting to me and new to me. Uh, I was, to answer your question, we don't... That doesn't we don't, we don't invest our money in CDs? No. I... Well, we don't even use the online quite portal. Frank, quite <laughs> frankly, I wasn't sure what our limitations were as a city, and I've never heard of anyone uh, like Alex uh, who has that type of business in... I've never been approached by anybody yeah. five star or any other institution to do anything with them. Like, so it's a little, little nervous about the concept. Historically, uh, I didn't know what was available to me, and with the tax cap and things in, in play like that, I was a little worried about investing money. Uh, what happens if we lose money? Then, then, then the taxpayers would come after you and the, and the mayor. And uh, I, I was a little uneasy uh, to do anything of that sort. Bill, we I, have had CDs in the past. Bill, I recall a conversation at NICOM with an individual who said that municipalities have to be very cautious with how they invest their money. Mm -hmm. That uh, there was only, and again, I'm. We, I can take this offline with you, but that there was, uh, he was like a state-sponsored agency that we could give him our extra cash 
and he could put it in the marketplace and, and because we can't use our cash or our liquidity to essentially as an investment to earn a deal. Are you familiar with what are the rules as far as? So you bring up a fantastic point. One of the things that we do at 3 plus 1 before we provide any information, any data, is review your investment policy statement. Yeah. If you don't have an investment policy statement, we provide language to create one. And if you do, we will review it, make sure it's up to date with all the marketplace options in New York State, because we don't want to obviously recommend anything that is not within those recommendations. Your options are very limited in New York State, uh, especially compared to other states that we work in. For example, in Pennsylvania and South Carolina, public entities are allowed to invest in corporate debt, commercial paper, hmm. not in New York State, not even, not even close. Um, but that is one of the first things that we do, and it's something that we continually score an entity on. Uh, with each report, we include what's called the cash best score. It's got five factors that go into calculating that final score, and it's something that we use to hold yourselves accountable, but also hold us accountable and it can track your performance. And one of those five factors is your investment policy statement, making sure that you have all the options in the state available to you under your current policy. So Fred, <coughs> what I was gonna ask, um, so this is above and beyond what municipal solutions could do for us. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, like, cause I knew that, I, like the county does this. <coughs> the county invests their money in different CDs and, and things like that all the time, but they're, when I, you know, I heard about the county doing it, but I always thought, you know, because the city doesn't really have much of a liquid stance. We're smaller potatoes. We can't invest what the county does. We don't have the surplus for that. Um, you know what I mean? So I can see where Fred's afraid of the risk, you know what I mean, given that we have a smaller pot and, you know, that's a bigger loss for us. But at the same time, it doesn't hurt to invest in a few CDs here and there with the cash we've got sitting to generate some, some decent, better interest than we're... Already investing. Well, I, th I think, I guess my my understanding is, you know, our surplus isn't just sitting out there, right? Typically, really, our liquidity comes when we get paid, right? Uh, Fred, when we get tax revenue, when we, people pay their property taxes, is when we are cash heavy. We are cash heavy May, June, July, August. It slopes down into follows through till March, and then when we we get our aim and uh, we're made whole on at the county level on our taxes, delinquent taxes and mm -hmm. water and sewer bills. So we have an influx in March, but between August and February, we're, we're continually losing cash. Yeah. And that's something that we pick up on across all of our entities. Is you all have those excess dollars, especially during certain times of year, where you know it's available or you know it, it could be out for maybe a month to three months. Um, but the one thing that we have found across every entity we work with, is there is 12 months of opportunity. We're focused on every single dollar, not just the big influx of revenue that you may get in, in the spring or the summer. We're looking in your low points, where is that opportunity? Um, because we're not looking at just the low hanging fruit investment dollars. We look at the entire banking relationship every dollar to see when it's needed and where we think you're going to be in the next three months. That's how we spend quarterly updates because there's always actionable next steps. And the marketplace changes drastically. When our firm was first started in the early 90s as an investment manager, that's when they developed the algorithm technologies that we use today. When we brought one 3 plus 1 as it is today truly came about in about 2014, banks were going around as public entities and saying, Thank you, but no thank you. We don't need your business anymore because interest rates were so low that it was costing banks money to work with you all because they have to collateralize every dollar that you have on deposit. Mm -hmm. And that's a costly process to them if they're not making anything on it. Mm -hmm. Where interest rates go drastically drives what a public <coughs> banking space looks like. And we've seen banks put two feet in and take two feet out in a span of six months um, based on where rates have gone and how committed they want to be to the marketplace. And, and that's a very important note because it, it changes <coughs> rapidly. Last year at this time we were talking about rates rising and it's been about six months now of consistent decreases that most people did not see coming. I don't know why it, it's going to happen. So it's something that we're continually trying to monitor 
and make sure our clients are aware of where they need to be looking. Any other questions? <clears throat> Out of the list of references, so you mentioned what, Batavia? Yes. Bill, do you know the mayor of Batavia? Uh, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Maybe it would be worth. Yeah. I think he'll provide he'll, he'll provide us with a list okay. of other references too. Okay. We could we can check out. Yeah. yeah. So an, a, a demo or an example report would be helpful. Absolutely. Okay. I think what excited Bill and I about this is that over the last couple of years we've, we've recognized as a group that our revenues are flat and we have to fight and come up with ideas to increase revenue, whether it be permits or whatever. This is an example to Alex cost a figure of thirty to forty thousand dollars a year in additional investment income. That's a half a percent on our uh, property tax. So sure. It's mm -hmm. a big number and uh, that's I think that's why Bill and I Great. invited him here. Okay. Well, thank, you thank you all very much for your time. Thank you. Okay, approval of committee reports. Is there are none? Okay, I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? All right. All right. We're adjourned. <coughs> okay, so I'll call to order of <coughs> planning for Tuesday, November 19th. Uh, let the record show that all committee members are present. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of the previous committee meeting, which was held on Tuesday, October 1st. Uh, can I have a second? Second. Second by Alderman and Adriano. All in favor? Aye. Any, any opposed? Okay, minutes are approved. We have no unfinished business. Uh, two items, uh, new items uh, for referral. Uh, number one is a presentation discussion uh, regarding CDS housing uh, from Ann Kivari. Ann? Welcome. Thank you. I see some familiar faces. Um, I'm Ann Kivari. I am the executive director of the City of Olean Housing Authority. And I've been employed there since 2004 as the assistant to the executive director, and then as of 2012 as the executive director. And I, I know um, I, I just wanted to bring forward some concerns uh, with regards to this current project, but I know that that is full steam ahead. Uh, but there are some concerns that I feel that I would be negligent if I didn't point out to you, and that you will need to know if you're. You know, considering any other type of subsidized or income-based or low-income tax credit type housing, um, particularly downtown, but not necessarily downtown. Um, I, I have had very little, very little interaction with Mr. Weatherby, and if you were led to believe any other situation between he and I, um, I had maybe two or three conversations with him a year ago, according to my email, and a face-to-face -face meeting with him. And then up until um, the day of your last meeting, I had not heard from him or seen him. I had a representative, I believe, from his firm call me and have a, a five-minute conversation about my waiting list. And at that point, I was reticent to speak to him because the first time I had spoken to him, he didn't really identify who he was and what the survey was you know, intended for. So um, <coughs> I, I got a little more uh, educated in the process. I actually ran into uh, Lenny and Ray at the Beef and Barrel. I had no, I had not seen or heard from Ray. I had no interaction from him whatsoever. And um, subsequently, and why I'm here is that, you know, having read the article about your meeting that evening, something caught my eye. And I, I did pick up the phone and call Ray and our relationship can probably be summed up by letting me know that he hung up on me. <laughs> so that's kind of how our relationship is. Um, can I pause real quick? I'm trying to cure, cure who, Lenny Ray, like, I, Ray Mr. Weatherby. Weather, okay, Ray um, Weatherby, that was the guy that came in from Rochester for the market basket? <laughs> yeah. Okay, just checking. I'm sorry. Lenny is oh. Lenny Ligori. Lenny Ligori. Um, directions. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, the only person Sorry. I know over it in directions by name is Howard Cornwall. So that Sorry. was it. Yeah. So. And, and can I just also clarify, who, who do you represent in this in this whole thing? Who the you City work? of Olean Housing Authority. Okay. <coughs> and before we get started, just to kind of put it in context, how many units do you have overall? Three hundred and three hundred and six, at six different sites, uh, almost half and half uh, senior citizen, 
uh, slash disabled and family units. Okay. Okay. Yep. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so I read the article, um, and what jumped out at me because in the last I want to say 12 to 24 months there have been uh, enormous changes in um, not just public housing, subsidized housing, but in landlord and tenant rental situations. Um, but one of the things that jumped out at me, and I, I, I needed clarification, so I called Ray first, um, was the paragraph or the sentence that said, he added, the affordable housing targets individuals and small families making between 25,000 and 35,000 a year. So a single mother who was a nurse, for example, and CDS will not participate in the Section 8 Federal Housing Voucher Program. And that really jumped out at me because um, as of April of 2019, they passed the Lawful Source of Income Non-Discrimination Act, um, basically to protect the individuals that have Section 8 and uh, from a landlord saying, I'm not going to participate. Traditionally, a landlord could say, I'm not going to accept that voucher. I don't rent to Section 8. And so this is now in, in concluded with all of the other um, uh, factors that you cannot rent to somebody for. Uh, sex, race, creed, color, age, disability, marital status, and so forth. It also is now, or source of income. So it is, so I, I, I called him and I wanted to know, you know, what did that mean? Because to me it meant you weren't going to have Section 8 participants there. Well, he said not necessarily, and I said, you know, my concern was, was this presented to you? Was this proposed to you in, in such a fashion that you were going to have a particular type of clientele there or not have a particular type of clientele there? Because if that is the case, then I can assure you it's extremely difficult and, and there's a lot of uh, laws that will prohibit you from any type of trying to um, prohibit a certain type or a certain financial class of individuals from renting your apartment. If they pass your background check and they have a Section 8 voucher, then they, then you must not, not deny them based on that. Certainly you will do background checks and you will do... This, this led to me um, going over to see Roseanne Larson. Roseanne Larson is the director of the Section 8 program. It's terribly confusing. We are one of about five public housing authorities in New York State that do not administer both programs. It's very unusual that we don't administer Section 8 and public housing. We are two different entities. Um, Mr. Weatherby has continued to clar classify the City of Only and Housing Authority as extremely low income. And we are not extremely low income. We are, federal public housing is low income. And he targeted the twenty-five to $35,000 range for families, um, two bedroom or one bedroom, when every year HUD publishes their 2019 income limits for Section 8 full tax credit programs for public housing to use as a guideline to see who qualifies if they're over income. And um, in Caracas County, um, the very low income even is uh, a family of two can make upwards of twenty six thousand five hundred and all can <coughs> make up to forty two thousand four hundred dollars and still qualify for one of our housing authority properties. Now you, you know you say somebody's making forty two thousand dollars, they don't they're probably not gonna want to live in public housing. But but our target isn't the extremely low income limit, which Mr. Weatherby continues to promote is our target population. It is not. And uh, the majority the majority of our tenants are not on uh, public assistance. They are working individuals, um, contrary. So, I, and, I'll, and I will try to be brief, but this really concerned me. I'll get back to going over to see Ms. Larson, because if he, you know, this was indicating to me that, and, and I might have read it wrong, he might have been quoted wrong, it might have been printed wrong. But that's There's what- There's the Times Herald. I was concerned, but, you know, I just, I wanted to clarify it with him. And I went over to see Roseanne, and she she handed me this marketing and public assistance referral agreement between <coughs> CDS Monarch, and, and he sent it to Roseanne Larson, um, City of Olean Housing Authority, Roseanne Larson, Executive Director. And throughout this rental agreement, it says that um, the owner and developer, CDS Monarch, 
affirms that preference in the selection of tenants for 100% of the available vacant units will be given to persons from the local housing authority's waiting list. Um, the local housing authority's waiting list um, or other existing waiting lists for subsidized housing and or persons and families whose current housing fails to meet the basic standards. He goes on and says, the owner and developer, meaning CD, um, S. Monarch further affirmed that it will provide notice to the City of Olean Housing Authority, the local housing authority, a local rental assistance administer, I'm taking that to be Section 8, of the availability of units and will accept the referrals made by the City of Olean Housing Authority at the request of the persons being referred. He continuously refers throughout this entire arrangement to the city or agreement to the City of Olean Housing Authority, addresses it to the City of Olean Housing Authority, Roseanne Larson, Executive Director. Um, I, I, I was just, I was just floored by this. And this was the conversation that led to him hanging up on us. So um, he amended it evidently, uh, but it still has the, the local housing authority waiting list. And, and I just said, I felt like he was contradicting himself. Um, it, it is, as I said, he, he, we are having, you know, we have a, a lot of vacant apartments. We have a lot of individuals that move in, they pay one or two months rent and they move it out. It's an ex if you are a private landlord in this city, I think you can attest to this. We have a very transient rental population right now in the city. Mm -hmm. Very transient. And these are individuals that have income. They will pay the first month's rent, perhaps the second month's rent, and then they will not pay uh, thereafter. And the new New York State tenant landlords the New York State Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act that was passed, I believe it was August, has basically crippled the landlord in the selection process, in the eviction process, um, start to finish now to evict somebody will take you approximately almost three to four months now. And, and if you have not crossed your T's and dotted your I's, and we have an attorney at our disposal, I don't know how Joe Landlord is handling this, but legal aid across the street has given the judge and uh, the, the cheat sheet basically and the advocate has a cheat sheet and uh, it, it's a game changer you 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 are um, facing some very serious criminal charges if you do not follow this as a landlord um, and you know Ray said well your selection process needs to be a little stricter we have a 17 page application we do, um, you know, we, we do the unified court system um, background check, the Canada's County Sheriff's check, the National Sex Offender Registry check, and American Tenant Screen, which is a credit check. When the 45-year-old man or woman that's standing in front of us says, I don't have any prior landlords, I can't give you any prior landlords for references. You know, we don't care about your credit score, but we're looking at the 15 addresses that have come up on this. So we are... We are incredibly diligent on our screening process, and still, the rental population is incredibly transient. They are not staying. Um, we spent $3,595.10 in our last fiscal year on background checks on every single applicant over the age of 18, and a third of those we don't even place because they don't pass the most rudimentary background. And it's not no income, it's low income, and not very low income. So I have really grave concerns about what was presented as to what the type of population is going to be in this facility. Um, there are certainly housing needs in the city and try as you might to have a particular type of population there. You, you, will, not, you will not succeed. And I'll conclude with saying, you know, I have a lot of complaints about the, the Olean House. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of the way it looks. When that was developed for senior citizen housing back in, I think it was 1972, um, somewhere along the line, I'm not sure at what point, HUD required any type of senior housing now unless, it, unless when it was um, you know, specifically stated that it has to be senior slash disabled. And at that time, I think the, the, the perception was wheelchair, blind, deaf, now it's senior slash disabled. Disabled means that your income source is from SSDI or SSI. SSDI, um, you know, is the 25-year-old the, the um, struggling 
uh, schizophrenic or mentally health, mental health uh, issues. And so that is primarily what the Olean House has, has become. It is now no longer housing for the elderly. It is, um, it is some uh, housing for independent individuals, but their income source is disability. And that is, and that is because by law, if we have a vacant apartment and, and it's senior slash disabled, we, we, and that person has passed the background check and is a qualified individual, you cannot de decline their application simply because you'd rather keep it senior citizen. It just, it doesn't work. You, it is federal law, it's New York state law, it's federal law. So I, I just was compelled to tell you uh, that in your future considerations, and, and, if, and if this was what you were led to believe was going to be the situation at the, at the, the site, it, it's uh, not possible. Ann, can I ask a couple questions? Um, how many vacancies do you have right now? I couldn't tell you about that. Okay. okay. The other, th uh, and I'm so glad you came tonight. I wish you would have been here maybe too. before <laughs> the presentation. I felt that he was very, uh, well, I felt that too. Um, I was a little, uh, uh, a little surprised that it was given to us vote tonight because I, regardless of what other council people had heard, I really didn't know much about it other than what was on Facebook, so I was a little perturbed about that. But I think the, I think the way it was handed to us could have been different. And I, I would have hoped, I would have liked to see you come and give us this presentation back then instead of now. And I think that's really a disservice to our community. Um, you know, I deliver meals to a lot of the, the places around town. <coughs> And <clears throat> there are good tenants, and there are tenants that you'd like to probably get rid of. But it's very tough to do that. Mm -hmm. And I just think any kind of housing going forward is going to have the same issue. And you're, you're perfectly within your guidelines. New York State, there's a lot of rules and regulations. And Kevin, you kind of made the renter landlords are really stuck. It yeah. takes three to four oh, months to evict somebody. We're, we're trying to prove that the new let rental law is, uh, violates the Geneva Convention because <laughs> no. of all the landlords it's killing. But, yeah. but thank you so much for coming. But I, I, um, had this I was just kind of, I mean, I, the only concern I had about the building was that somebody was doing something, which is, to me, awesome. I don't care how they get about it. I don't care if their business flops. They're renovating a business uptown and in the, in the downtown vicinity, and that was, that was my knowledge on the project. Mm -hmm. So... But at the same time, it's nice to have both sides of the story. Sure. And it kind of, it kind of sounds like this gentleman had his own agenda. Well, he's business. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's a business. He's, he's, he's a business. Um, it's not a, a big secret. I am one of the owners of the property, 422 East State Street. Um, I'm not sure what the exact complaint was tonight, though. Uh, CDS, they're not winging it. They have been around for a long time and they've been successful. Um, this wasn't surprised on anybody. Um, Linda was before the Zoning and Planning Board many meetings over a year ago. They're public meetings. They were. Oh, but, but I didn't interrupt we, you, please. Uh, I'll, can I'll I have a turn? Yeah. Uh, they were well attended meetings. I went. Mm -hmm. uh, there were lots of people from the public. You as a councilman received notices of all those mm -hmm. meetings. Uh, so it wasn't a secret at all. It was, it was in the newspaper a year ago. Uh, like it or not, affordable housing is a growth industry in the state of New York, promoted by the state of New York, by our Democrat governor and our Democrat-controlled House and state Senate. So this isn't just a uh, an accident it is being promoted by the state of new york um, and also the cds is going to inject over 10 million dollars into that property if if the deal goes through mm -hmm. that's good for olean that's good for that area they'll make it look very nice uh, they'll have a property manager that runs it is every tenant perfect no is every business perfect no not not CDS, not Olean Housing Authority, not the hospital, not hardware stores. All businesses have ups and downs or problems. So I don't know which, if your litmus test is perfection, but uh, this company is pretty good at what they do. But. I, if you, excuse me, if you know, okay. I think he's not winging it. 
I think this was incredibly sloppy. Right. Well, I don't to even have, know what that is. Have a legal <laughs> document. I haven't reviewed that, and well, no one else here has either, document. to my they knowledge. They have a legal document that has, you know, somebody else's business title and name, and ask that person to sign it and refer to, you know, you're not going to rent to Section 8, but you're going to give 100% a preference to 100% of the units. I just think it was really sloppy. Okay. Well, I don't know what that is, and I, so and I, I, I can't answer that. I was that. personally. Um, not informed of the, of the process at the, at the beginning. Was it his responsibility to inform you? No. Okay, well. Somebody should have reached out to the local housing uh, organizations. Myself, Aspen Towers, Roseanne Larson at Section 8. Um, I, I, I personally feel there's, because there is opposition to this. Mm. The people that do this for a living have some grave concerns about it. And, and to answer to what Nate just said, I agree on most of those points. The point I was making, that was our presentation that night, and we had a vote on it that night. I don't go to tell the planning board or the zoning board what to do. I feel they've always been a separate entity. Are you talking getting, about the tax? We know. Yeah, the payment? Yeah, that's, what, are we, what, are we, what did we I'm vote on? Yeah. The, to accept taxes. Right, and the tax thing, that's wonderful. I'm just saying the whole project it could have been handled differently where they could have come sooner. It wasn't in the council, it wasn't in the council yeah. purview to make a ruling on that. Yeah, we can't. Right. And we can't all we voted down, I got that. Yeah, we, we accepted taxes, right? Yeah, we can't, yeah, we can't vote up or right. down that project. It's mm -hmm. private property and they can do what they want. And But my point is, Kevin, it would have been nice to hear the other side, the, what what the situation is with our housing. That's so we wouldn't have accepted point. the taxes? If the taxes are, anytime somebody wants to give you money, you're crazy not to take it. Yeah, My yeah, point yeah. is, hearing this now kind of makes me wonder what kind of business this gentleman's running. And I'm sorry, taxes are no taxes. He, 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 he had developed some, some and, successful. Uh, I think it was just the way it was handled that made me feel upset. That's well, what I think uh, in full disclosure. Ray Weatherby has offered to come and speak to the council again if anybody has any questions. Qu quite honestly, I don't. He already spoke. Yeah. yeah. I don't see the need to I didn't come here to try to, to, to try to halt this. I just, for future considerations, there's an awful lot that really should be presented. I, okay. I think that we could have more information from the Zoning and Planning Board if the council rescinded those boards and we just took on that responsibility. Then we'd always know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah it's a, Point. Uh, okay, thank you very much for coming. I mean, this, we are tax, this, this, we have a, we pay a large pilot payment as well, so we, we do have a say in the. Sure. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Very, very much. Thank you. And if Mr. Wedderby ever is created up there, I would like to be present too. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> then, uh, okay, so moving on to uh, item B, a presentation. Uh, for our facilities uh, facility needs report by Bob Ring, the esteemed, the distinguished. You have all received. I well emailed winded. this document out to everybody. Oh, it's right. a large Is document. Yours or mine? I yeah. think Are we sharing? Oh, that's one. That's huge. Uh, we'll share. Yeah. <laughs> Can you read this and get back to me? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Don't show Sue Cooper these packets. Oh, I try to add and cut down all the streets. Um, Send three well, of them. Can you send it triple cat? I just made it for the can I can I make an official statement on the record too? Oh, I'm officially in favor of the deer culling project. Thank I you. came within feet of absolutely annihilating a deer on York Street. It's gotta be A or B, Bob. I had one run out for me on West State you got, you a couple weeks ago. It was yeah, it was BG. Five, but thank you for the support. Five o'clock in the morning. I'm just like somebody just I needed your East State I had it on Yeah, I think there's a converter up there that converts it from VGA to HDMI because they also have a. My friend just pulled the car and Legit, that, that was no, no, I understand. Yeah. Like, oh my God, Nate's right. But thank you for the support. Yeah, because I took up deer hunting this year and I can't find any. Uh, are you on East State or West? <laughs> uh, I saw some by Home Depot and I know you can't fire a firearm within 500 feet of a residence, but Home Depot, nobody lives there. So I was half tempted to shoot one. People live at Home Depot. I have a deer haven in North Home. Yeah? Yeah. Around the railroad track. I can shoot, a, I can shoot 150 feet with a bow from a residence. 
There's 20. I've been no, we pretty, earlier. Well, I spent a lot of time talking to Otto about okay. DC and enforcement. Bob, killing me, Bob. Oh. Oh. See, you pressed the lights one. Come on. I think it looks better without the lights. You had it a minute ago. I thought he was a VGA, A or B. Is it this thing? Were you playing with this thing? Just tell us what we need. I don't even think that's it. All right, Bob. Yeah, what's broken? A lot of things. Yeah, uh, no really signal. Really nice PowerPoint here. Oh, I mean, I, I mean, how does it work one minute and? Oh, there it is. So VGA. 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 There you go. Let's talk to uh, what's his name? Jason. Jerry. Jason. Jerry. Press source. I, the people who come up in Allegheny. There you go. I just want to have it. Shana, na, 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 na. Oh, it's Texas Instruments. Did they go out of business? <laughs> I think they actually did. Oh, you know what? <laughs> we already have a copy of that. Can we get John, it's an HDMI cord. I've been trying HDMI. I've been trying but Yeah, unplug it, plug it back in. But that's an HDMI cord there. So it's got to be an HDMI. I got it the first time on. Hey. Please, there it is. Hey. Hey, Bob, make your computer active now. Quick, do Maybe. something, Bob. That was probably the main issue. It probably went to screensaver. It's still oh not getting a signal. Goodness. There we go. Hey. Once again, this thing is shuttling from Ward 3 fixes the problem. Oh, my goodness. We have a position for you in IT. Has anyone Nobody killed. 26 displaced, I think they said. Talk about the horn. Talk about the fire in Hornell. Oh yeah, that, I saw that. Yeah, was that a couple days ago? Yeah, still happening. Is Radio Shack still in Hornell? No. It turned about into the, Verizon, I think. I, I know everybody knows about the explosion on, uh, on West Branch Road. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the second explosion in Allegheny. That's horrible, right? That Terrible. But imagine that, what that dog must have been. Oh yeah. my God. It's just like the couch in the yard. Was it personal consumption? They found yeah. distribution. They found residue yeah. at the laboratory in the school. So I just remember that's that the second one. Oh, really? So are we. So this is where you ask for money? <laughs> of course it is. Until the end. Your Fred guy started with money. Get it from Fred's guy. I'm sorry, yeah. Fred's guy. Fred's guy's going to show us all the money you need. He's, he's got a national grid plan for you. He's going to give us, we put in 40000 we get 80000 That's the real reason he came down. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. He looked like he was about 18, John. Um, you all were emailed a report a couple weeks ago. I printed out like three of them. There's 77 pages. Yeah, really I printed out my own computer. The first four pages summarize our needs in buildings. I've been here about two years talking to staff, talking to department heads, facility managers about um, needs in the city and there are some dire needs things that need to that. be addressed sooner rather than later. A lot of them are somewhere between um, in progress and, and shovel ready. So I'm going to run you through those quickly. Again, there's the report. Most of it is supporting documentation. So I've had engineering firms in to confirm or to just reiterate kind of what I've, the work that I've done. Um, I'm sort of, well, I'm the facilities manager from a structural standpoint. Um, codes, I kind of work in tandem with them and I've talked to EJ about this report. Um, fire code and fire, um, the fire inspections aren't part of this and aren't part of my duties, but again, you'll see a lot of these are, are structural issues um, around around the city and you know those are facilities that I've looked at these this, you know what the assumption is these are capital level projects that would either have to be funded you know through borrowing or you know some may be budget items but um, you know they're bigger ticket items this one we talked about several months ago um, this is the entrance to the Times Square uh, to the city building on Times Square 
Um, in the spring, about a basketball sized hole started forming in the concrete near the handicap ramp. Um, what we found out is underneath there, there's about a 15 foot drop down, um, and that concrete um, was just the tip of the iceberg. It's deteriorating underneath there. Um, the real problem is salt and water damage. Um, although that project has been in the budget for as long as I can remember, it's never been funded. And now um, I think it's going to be about a hundred, hundred and fifteen thousand dollar project. Um, and this is kind of in um, in order of need. This project is dire need. It's deteriorating. It's a public safety hazard, and really needs to be funded before in next construction season. Or I'm going to suggest that we put you know caution tape in front of this entrance and basically shut it down. So um, right here, there's a plate as you can see where those two uh, cones are and that's where the hole started forming. Right now we just put a plate over it. There's a whole breezeway underneath this section of concrete. And you know, when we salt here, there's it's shaded and it's getting in the cracks. So there's beams underneath here in the basement that are starting to crack. So the building is all concrete except for it's got steel beam reinforcement and there's concrete around the beams and that concrete is starting to crack. Um, here's the hole that you can see where the steel plate's in place. And this is the concrete beam, kind of a, a, a picture's upside down, but you can see the cracking. And all that is because water's getting in and salt is getting in, deteriorating the rebar and the concrete and causing all sorts of issues. And Bob, the reason we can see sunlight through the hole is because you've removed the ramp, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you wouldn't oh. see it. This is like right at the base of the line. Okay, yeah, I'm just understanding it. So ramp's coming in from the right left? Here, right at the bottom. <coughs> Where that hole is, right, right, okay. which is right here. And this is actually with the steel plate on it. So it's a much bigger hole, like it's, it's a much bigger hole than you can see. So the steel plate is to the left of the light from this angle. Yeah, right there's the edge of it. Okay, I got it. Yeah. So that's project number one. I've rated each one on, on summary you need. This one, again, like I said, is, is in 10 out of 10. I had you and Otto Associates come down on the structural team and look at our plans, make sure that you know they have a design idea. Um, where we would kind of take out all of this, re-pour a new concrete ramp, um, take out some of the brick and put weeps in, and make a long-term solution. Bob, when you put that back together, will it essentially look the same way other than the aluminum ramp is gone? Or what will it look like? Um, you know, I think we'll bring the elevations up on everything. So, like, you don't have this big step. This handicap ramp isn't even ADA compliant. There isn't five feet in between that railing and that wall. So all that will come out and then we'll just pour all concrete in there. Um, there's water that sits here. I'm sure you've seen it. And even on a day like today where it was dry, it's wet. Um, so all that pavement can come up and drain towards the catch basin that's, you know, to the west. And, uh, um, you know, it would be basically this would all be redesigned and then underneath um, the rebar that's been exposed and the cracking, you know, what's happened would all have to be Will we see a rendering before we vote on it, or are we just going with a Yeah, and that's the report. Um, the the, yeah, I mean, the mock-up is in there. there. It's all the structural data is in there. You know, please review. Um, that's all included on almost all these projects. Did, did you say that the, the, the upgraded um, version would, would we get, colored get pictures. rid of the aluminum ramp? Yes. So it all be like a concrete ramp? Mm -hmm. There's enough strength in the concrete mm -hmm. underneath mm -hmm. to take that out yeah. and just re-pour it mm -hmm. and then shed the water away. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. all that was a good And drums? Yeah. For what it is, it's so really We have it, right? Oh, it's right there at the next page. Yeah, I think, it, I mean, there's some uh, yeah. intrinsic value. You got right on track there. That whole map, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean that, I mean, it, it serves a purpose. It worked well for what it was, but yeah. it also, you know, all the water is melted in one place. Yeah. So far, it's kind of keep those under salt and free stuff. And, and time. The second project, which is also um, a high need, is uh, the fire station. Um, Jim Theodore got a hold of me one day, and we went up in the fire um, truck and looked at uh, the stone and the brickwork that's at the top of the building. It's um, it's really deteriorated, as you can see, the mortar joints are starting to come out. All that brick is loose. These stones that are um, on the top are loose. You can you can move them, and they rock, and all the mortar is falling out of them. Um, I don't know if 
the last time you went on South First Street, but their cars, their sidewalk right in the front of this building. You know, I, I talked to EJ about this too. Um, you know, at any time, one or two bricks could fall down, or the whole side of the, the brick facade could fall down. Um, mm -hmm. It's an accident waiting to happen. Um, on this one, um, I think it was last year or the year before, we discussed if we were going to keep that station house open. Mm -hmm. So is that being taken into consideration that it might not be a long-term used building? Well, I, you know, I, I'm not suggesting, you know, which buildings we're using, and I'm not suggesting we fund these, you know, I mean, right away. I'm just, you know, updating you, I think, for now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that needs to be considered. And for other projects, there's there's several pathways that we can go with okay. it. Um, Regardless, if we throw that, if you just abandon that building just as an idea, you still have to fix the bricks because there's still people that walk there. 7-Eleven's right there. People are walking constantly. Oh, you sure. maybe handy like that. Yeah. This keystone is close. You can see that at some one point someone repaired the, um, you know, the mortar joint there, but there's cracks in the mortar, the loose mortar around a lot of the keystone. Those generally don't fall out, but, you know, it's sunk already, and if that falls out, then all that brick comes with it. That holds it in place in an archway. Um, so again, it's fifty to $75,000. Um, I'm not, I'm, you know, a, a masonry expert, so I, I think we should be asked to investigate it further. Um, you know, maybe have somebody who is an expert in that way. If we do want to fund this project, start there. They come up with a plan. They come up with an estimate, and we bid it out um, and take care of it. Uh, there's three projects at the city garage that are being contemplated. Um, and again, you know, if we stay in that facility, I guess it's really a good question. Um, I still think it's most likely that we stay there, regardless of, you know, development ideas that have been thrown around. I mean, I'd love to explore those. Um, I'd, like, I'd love to try those out. But um, if we stay here, these are modest improvements that we absolutely have to do that will keep us, um, you know, we'll, we'll 20 years down the road will be good, you know, if we make these improvements. And again, like I said, they're modest. It's not the Taj Mahal or anything shiny. It's just um, starting with the, the fuel facility. So those tanks were installed in the 1980s. Um, they're very old. They're double walled, but they've started to fail some testing. So the exotic testing, which is, you know, like electrical current that runs through them to keep from corrosion, that failed this past year. So now we have to do an air test inside them. We have to drain them. I know it's costing more money just to maintain them. Um, we have to pay for additional testing. And, you know, right now, what do you mean about air test? Is it pressurizing? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so there, you know, this is the uh, the main building. This is the garage. This is our model storage building and then the salt shed, which is in the wood. And then our fuel facility is over here. We don't even have gated, you know, entries to the building, so when police or fire want to come and, and um, get gas in the middle of the night or something like that, they have to come out, get out of their cars, unlock it, you know, go in there. So we're looking um, at replacing this. <laughs> we're, we're looking at replacing uh, the fuel facility, and um, we're debating on whether what site it would be. We have limited amount of room at the city garage. We've actually been speaking with the school and, and other partners on how to fund this, perhaps through agreement. Um, so this project is in the works. It might be something that's brought up um, to you all you know, in the near future as far as either moving it to another site or, or replacing the tanks and, <coughs> uh, and, and putting them back here. Are there any other municipalities that have uh, their own uh, facilities like that? The, the village of Allegheny or Portville or Ashford County or something like that, <laughs> somewhere close that we could share services with. Do they, you know what I mean? Like, I know it's kind of a bigger question, but. Yeah, I mean, the county has one. It's up by Dunning and Dunning Garage, you know. 7th Street, 7th and Buffalo. I don't want to get off track here, no, but do we so. save money having our own fuel facility? Is our fuel actually cheaper? Why don't we just buy it from a, someone who sells gas at a so a retailer. Well, yeah, we still pay big free, but we also would pay, you know, if we went with the county, we pay a surcharge, first of all, but we'd also have to drive up on the hill outside the city, and so would the police and fire and whoever else used it, you know, our... No, so Oleans Gas, uh, we don't have to pay New York State fuel tax. Correct. So Which we is pay over 50 cents a gallon. We get it on state debt, right? Yeah. 
Okay, so it is a big savings. Mm -hmm. So the county's in the same category. Yeah, I would assume they are. And, and Mark Donahue is our manager. He's certified to manage the things. He's certified to manage, you know, the filling and public facilities and things like that. So again, we think but we need enough partners, and we don't know the, the funding, you know, the funding match at this point. But if we get enough partners together, we may we may be able to do a shared uh, municipal grant and get a fuel facility that could help a number of um, you know municipalities around here. And it doesn't just have to be like a town or a city or a village, it can be, you know, a nonprofit as long as they have a tax ID. So that's where we're at right now with that. But we just well, that, that's been an idea that's been kicked around for a while now, right? Mm -hmm. So is there any, I mean, is it always just kind of bouncing around? Do we have any actual interest yeah, I taking think we, place? We have some interest now with, uh, with some people. and, and uh, I think we're, we would be the interest is to get uh, uh, go after one of the uh, the grants, uh, the, the feasibility study to do this that you can get the money from the state for it and then move forward under a shared service agreement. Uh, we've talked to the county many times about uh, possibly uh, uh, you know moving forward with having our vehicles drive out to Seventh Street and fuel there, uh, so that's still an option. So in well, maybe they don't. We still use salt. Yes. Yeah. What does the county use? Sand. They use uh, yeah, sand and sand uh, and salt. Because they, they have a new giant storage thing out on Seventh Street that they built, mm -hmm. didn't they? Is that a salt shed? I mm -hmm. think they did. They made a the Kansas farm there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just. Would it would it not be plausible to share that they salt? Could go and load up salt there. Um, there are a number of challenges. Like, there are a number of challenges with that. Okay. As far as having equipment up there, I mean, those our ten wheelers get like three miles per gallon, so it's driving up there you. essentially you know, a gallon or two of gas to get up there. So that's one challenge. You know, it, it's not that convenient. So I want to find out what it would cost us to have our own, manage our own, you know, and, and control, have a little bit of control over it, and then you know, okay. weigh options, right? When you have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, in the summary, you know, I think our need is 9 out of 10 on this because environmental cleanup on this would be very costly, um, and that could happen in the next, you know, near future, I guess, if I can it. Right so who, who comes in with that, the DEC? Yeah. The main re the main thing is when you remove the tanks, they test the soil. Yeah. You know, otherwise, they're, we're not going out taking soil samples, you know, below the tanks. But when it's the remediation happens, or when do the removal for mediation that they talked about. Yeah. Um, the outbuildings down at the city garage, so that's the metal storage building and the salt barn, um, they need to be addressed at some point. I had Ben Cook, um, structural engineer, <coughs> come in and take a look at these. You know, there's very limited life on these buildings, as he suggested. It's hard to see in this picture, but this building here, th this is full of concrete. It basically holds back the sides of the garage, uh, of the barn salt in there and when you push a loader into the each bay, those sides just kind of blow out. And you can see it's already blowed out. It's got some pretty significant structural issues. Um, I met with Carcatex and Lee over ideas on the layout and uh, you know estimates and stuff like that. They helped us out. Um, and they they suggested this could be repaired. So you know we have a price for potentially repairing this. Um, for the most part it's structurally sound. It just needs to be addressed before the sides fall in and, and mm -hmm. salt is exposed. This building is, you know, has a little bit of a different, um, you know, outcome. It, it's it's metal and it's not really fastened on the ground anymore. It's a metal truss building with a tin overlay. And the tin is starting to fall apart, starting to deteriorate. And, you know, when the wind blows through this garage, which is kind of coming in from the west, the sides of the building are starting to go like this when it's windy. You know, it, it's, a, it's a safety hazard to our employees. We need more space. Um, you know, this building can't be repaired, can't be saved without, you know, really significant cost. It's not heated, but to replace this with a heated building, um, you know, was is about say two hundred fifty thousand or three hundred thousand, um, and then another hundred thousand needs to repair uh, the salt barn. And you know, if we do say here again, needing more space. Um, having a bigger fleet, 
basically all the time. You know, we would reconsider a new layout for, um, you know, for the site. So I've looked into some of that. You know, again, I've gotten estimates for the, um, and, and the, the life of those buildings is very short. Um, the main building has got a little bit of a better, you know, outcome. You know, the main building is very structurally sound. That's not an issue at all. All three of those buildings went in 1910. So that building was, the, the main building was built to be very strong because we used to house um, you know, a lot of things in there. Um, <laughs> About the shed, how much are the cost to do one, sort of like the one the county has, is that the mesh bottom and mesh canvas top? Mm -hmm. Are those less expensive? About the same price as the repeater repair ones. They're relatively cheap. Yeah. Um, maybe, you know, maybe even around the same price or cheaper. But so that's always an option, I guess, when you take into account demoing this and, and mm -hmm. changing it around. Um, also, longevity. 2000, 2001, mm -hmm. when we last repaired that. Yeah. This one, this, they do last longer? Yeah, a long time. Yeah. I can't imagine. It's cheaper to replace the can. Oh, it's cheaper to replace the can. I guess, yeah, that would make sense. So, again, there hasn't been a lot of preventative maintenance on this building. The mortar joints are falling apart. I mean, it, it, it just needs some upgrades. Um, the air intake and exhaust system really needs to be replaced. In the winter, we bring all our vehicles inside at the end of the day. So, you know, I haven't been down there to test the air. But I'm 100% sure that it doesn't pass current regulations for, you know, air intakes. We need a new system there. The, you know, the foundation walls and, and the mortar joints, like I said, they need to be repaired by paving the site and maybe putting in some drainage, preventative maintenance measures, and, you know, simple, you know, just nondescript things that just need to be taken care of in order for the building to continue to, you know, see the 20, 30 more years. Um, Is there overhead crane in there or not? Yeah, we have one. You know, I think it'd be a good idea to replace the windows and replace the HVAC, HVAC system at the same time, try and get it to be more efficient in there. Um, that's one of our buildings that has the highest energy use. Um, and it's kind of obvious why um, it's got, you know, it's, it's big open, it's got high ceilings. We could mm -hmm. consider bringing the ceiling down in places. Um, but, but those are, again, just Hey Bob, is that the price for fixing all the buildings or just the main building? Just the main building. Hey. That'd be to reside it, put a new roof on, replace the intake, air intake system, um, replace the HV system, replace all the windows. That's for a new roof too? And yeah, yeah, I didn't have a idea about that, but I have an estimate. It's in, you know, it's in the report, okay. um, the full estimate for you know, the facility, the outbuilding, and this are all in one floor from Clark Madison. The water treatment plant, so this building is about 17 years old. From the beginning, there was issues in, um, with the south facing wall with water leaking out of um, where the air, uh, water filters are. And this is a project that we don't know that much about right now, but that seems to be um, a high need to, to fund. Um, this is maybe like a 15 foot section of wall and the entire wall essentially looks like this where um, water is leaking out of some of our reservoirs inside the building and right here this is a big crack so the concrete is basically failing. Um, at one point to satisfy the workmanship issues with this project there were, um, you know, it's really the cause of this is the workmanship and quality control of the original. They put in weeps into the building and they repaired it and they scraped it with whatever this stuff is and it failed again. So um, it's something to be taken care of. Right now we're working with Arcanus Engineering. Um, they did an initial report and they gave us the price, this price range. Um, right now they're working on a more detailed report with you know, full estimate and options on how we can repair this building. But um, again, the sum of need I think is high because you know it's, it's it's an issue with, uh, with clean water, you know, it could affect some of our processes. And we would take advantage of, if, if this wall were, were cut out and replaced, you know, with some of the structural parts that were, uh, our, uh, our filters, our gravity filters are right here, we would take that media out. That needs to be cleaned every 10 to 15 years. 
we would take it out and we would replace it and kind of relay all the filters in there. Bob, is this a product of the, the thing I always heard was that uh, when, they re when they did build the facility, uh, there was an issue with the contract allowing the concrete to sit for too long in the truck. And this is a product of that, as you say? I really don't know. I don't have like intimate knowledge of what happened then or how it was settled. Yeah. You know, I just know there's been a couple steps along the line and now we're still paying the price for it. But yeah, that's possible. It's a very political answer. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, okay. That, okay. Most buildings nowadays are built above ground like this. I find that surprising. I guess it's cheaper to build up than to dig down and build it, but you know, it just seems silly with the outcome of this project that it was built above ground and wasn't you know, built strong enough to stand you know, the pressures of water. So, you know, again, I'll, I can update you again when we get another report for this project. The old water filtration plant. This one kind of gets ignored, even you know, I don't think about it very often. Nobody goes in there, it's not really condemned right now by codes. And, um, I walked through this not long ago with uh, Dennis July 2019, and you know, the, the need to do something there, I don't think it's that great because it hasn't been heated. Nobody really goes in there for like 17 years since the original plant was built. Mm -hmm. um, it is built into the lobby, so the one potential is that the DUC comes along and says you need to take care of this building. It's built into the lobby and you need to figure out a way to solve that. I mean, that hasn't been, um, no one said anything. Make a nice, uh, the old water plant brewery. Somebody, some entrepreneur could. Somebody wanted a bottle of water. Yeah, just give it to them and then they can be the DUC's problem in a couple of years. Right. <laughs> a nice human who might want to do it. It might make, make for a nice building, but it is in awful shape. It's about 30 foot deep basement where all our pipe galleries are, where our reservoirs are. The roof is completely deteriorated. And this is the same kind of building. Um, you know, things are just falling off the walls with mold in there. We um, could say it's haunted. It's, yeah. And, and, and sell house. nights, overnight. Yeah, we'll stuff it full of hay. It looks scary. So. Nobody, again, yeah. nobody really goes in there because we really don't want them to. But Eventually, I think we have to do something about it. How much do you think it would take to demolish that? Uh, no, I really don't know. Quite a bit. Yeah, probably six figures, though. Oh, easily, yeah. But we could probably pay a company to come in and cut all the pipes and uh, get um, the engine and things like that out of there, like they did a tile for you. Know, you know, some, some money for that. You know, that would be maybe a first step. But Plausible girl. I can't imagine that anyone would ever want to secure this building. Mm -hmm. The um, HVAC system in this building is um, is very old. Uh, we just the air conditioner because this seems works fine it in works here. Just fine. Just fine. Mm -hmm. so that's the heat. That's not the heat. <laughs> that's the heat. The squirrel stuff, but this building is really bad. The original report. The original report. You know, I included the entire HVAC system. If you've ever been in a boiler room, it's about as big as this room. It's mm -hmm. huge. It's like a hot and cold deck. But, you know, from what I understand, it's pretty efficient. Mm -hmm. um, it has a variable speed motor that's been um, installed on it. And the control system on the unit is actually, you know, pretty new. So I think that's a pretty good change. But we really need to work on the control system. I think that'll help control, you know, our heating and cooling in the, in the building. It's, you know, really inconsistent but also the useful life of our control system has been met. Um, it's hard to tell, but this controller is, is a little darker than the others because we had to replace it last year and it cost $6,500. And we were really lucky to get this because these parts aren't made anymore. And hasn't found it on resale somehow. And uh, you know, these are all the zones that are in, our, in this building. And basically you would replace all this and replace you know, the thermostats and things like that. I think it'd make a big difference. And it'd save us from potentially catastrophic event where some of our zones or maybe the whole system failed and we couldn't keep the building because there wouldn't be any control for it. Wasn't there a big upgrade in the police department side some years ago? Was that mechanical or electronic upgrades? Um, we just replaced their heating and cooling system for their offices. They have a mini split in the dispatch office that is not that old. And then they're, they replace with a rooftop unit that, that jails, I think, the, where, the, uh, where the jail is. So.
so does all of us control that side too? No, the PlayStation is separate. That was an addition, so it has a separate heating system. Okay, so we're not talking about the PlayStation. We're just talking about the main building, the main three floors, and then the court system has a separate one that's about half the size of this room. So there's two big, you know, heating and cooling deck units that are massive. Mm -hmm. So again, I mean, this uh, might be something that I'd heat. like to budget. We budget thirty thousand for this, for buildings. Mm -hmm every year. Um, this would be a sixty or seventy thousand dollar project, so it's possible we could do it over the course of two budgets, although that funding is quite low right now after replacing the police's unit and some other things that we've had to do. Um, but you know, I, I want to try and make this a priority as opposed to say trying to replace those two for a, a quarter million dollar. You know, I think we can get along for a while, you know, without it. Uh, the Bartlett House HV system, um, I put this on here because last year it failed on one of the coldest days of the year um, and then the pipes broke at the hot water boiler system and um, radiant heat, uh, baseboard heat and one of the copper lines burst on the second floor and water went all over, floor damage and you know damage to some of the molding. So I put that on there. This is probably a budget item um, and the, the need is not you know, I, I put it at six out of ten, um, but you know, you can see this is, I don't know, I tried to find out what, what the age of this was by using the serial number and things. I would guess it's 40, 50, 60 years old. Um, we could replace it with a more efficient one and we'd save, you know, um, you know we'd save money over time and stuff for the initial investment, but something that, that could be budgeted. So I've never bought a boiler. They're really $8,000. They're like... Four or five thousand dollars for a decent one, and then when you start looking at the labor and material to install it for a swap out, for a municipality, eight to twelve grand ain't bad. I think that finance guy is gonna. Have to do some trickery. Yeah. If Maybe anybody, you can install boilers on the weekend. <laughs> if anybody would rather have a hard copy, um, we can print, you know, we can print boilers. Let us, let us know. Were you going to take that and, I, and get back to me? No. I'm going to keep my house warm. So I, I guess, <laughs> what's, what's, the, what's the next step? So well, what, are, what, what are you, what, Bill, Bob, what are you guys suggesting? Well, I think like, some of the things we may be able to handle with budget. Yeah. Do that, but we'll just have to come up with a plan on uh, the, the facilities. So let's take a look at what the, the, the biggest needs are, and we definitely have to do something with the city building out here. So that's probably that's the yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, incorrect. We didn't put any money for towards that. I know we sure. talked about it during budget time. Uh, didn't we? We didn't We've, set anything uh, aside that's, for that. That's yeah. been cut out. Every, I thought it was talked about like the every last year for the last meeting. since I've been here for. Sure. Yeah. Well, we talked about the ramp itself. We didn't know about, you know, like the, uh, the hole to the Goonie Island. We knew we thought we had the, we, we talked about funding for the hole underneath, didn't we? I just updated you. Yeah, it was like a, the first time it happened. They sprung it on us. Like a, and we didn't commit any funds to that? No. No, no. Okay. No. We had a, remember we had a tight budget? I think the, the talk was we'd get a, uh, we'd get, You'd a get a quote plan together. Oh, okay. Which we did with, uh, Clark, who did the plan? Uh, Di Donato. Di Donato did okay. the plan. So now we have now we know what we're actually dealing with. Uh, okay. Yeah. So. I'd I'd like to just throw something out there that like for for the future, like I think that like I mean we've got street crews, right? These guys lay asphalt. Like that's a very like you know what I mean? You have to know what you're doing to do that. You have to pour concrete for sidewalks. I mean we could do certain things in house. Um like I don't know, it's one of the basic things that like I learned when I started construction was how to tuck point brick and mortar and, and we don't have anybody in like the city that does that and I really think that like either we cross train or have a, a an additional group of people that go around and do this building maintenance because we have enough buildings that it's worthwhile to do that to mitigate even if it costs us a little less money in the long run we're dispersing that over a long period of time where we can be maintaining these buildings on a yearly basis just tuck pointing brick like hey fire department called they noticed something Hey, get over there. Okay, hey, we gotta, we're spending the next couple of days laying these bricks on the top of the building. I mean, it's really not a hard thing to keep a crew of guys that are maintaining buildings. And, I mean, for the cost of maybe one of these smaller projects a year, or well, 
maybe one of the middle of the road projects, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, these never projects never really pop up. Unless they're so major that, hey, over the last 15 years, this huge retaining wall is caving in and you can't really repair it, right? It's more of a wait till it gets really bad. Like, there's certain things, but I think going forward, I think that's something we really need to consider is budgeting for additional 100 line items to have people maintaining this stuff because this is something we neglect until the 11th hour and then all of a sudden, hey, we need a new facility that's about to fall down. Uh, any other questions for Bob? Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, well done uh, on that. Um, any other uh, comments or uh, yes, Kelly? Uh, we are in strategic planning, yes. so just I need to think. Hard. We're supposed to have our regular meeting on Christmas Eve. Do we have a plan? Next Tuesday, there should be a resolution to move it back. So we're going to move it back to the 17th? Whatever. Yes. Okay. Okay. Move it back or forward? Thank you. No, can move it forward because it's the first. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, week after. Week after. Uh, yeah, that's, I think I'm just stuck up on the terminology when I move something. That, yeah. We, uh, Perfect. Thank you. And then just so for planning purposes, too. Uh, we could have a meeting in the morning on Sunday. Looks to see if it'd be fun to all get together. Yeah. Looks like the reorganizational meeting. Christmas Day. Uh, annual meeting will be on on the 2nd, January 2nd, 2020. What day does that fall on, though? It's a Thursday. Could you get a special guest to read your speech? Samuel Jackson is reading his speech this year. <laughs> Samuel Jackson. <laughs> What do you have against me reading it? No, nothing. I just okay. Samuel Jackson's been doing a lot of that stuff lately, so I figured. Now, when do we put the resolution into the parking lot? <laughs> uh, we need. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, we need to. Uh, I think we got one going. Do we have a resolution going in for the parking, Tiffany? Yep, next Tuesday. Okay. Yeah, I was asked about that. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, see, now I'll, I'll make a motion to. Uh, nope, I will not do that because there's no committee reports. Uh, I will make a motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Second by Alderman Andriano. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you. Aye.